wherever you're from, you probably have more construction going on than here in West Hawaii. There's very, very few houses being built in this area right now. More on the other side, but if you've been following the news for the last couple of years, it's gotten incredibly expensive to build houses. And uh, I would sh- I'd share the numbers with you, but it bore you, number one. And number two, you've got to have some context to know what that's all about. But in the time that I've lived here on the island, I've noticed that um, on a regular basis, you will find people selling houses that are half built. They had great intentions. They, they managed to wrangle together the hundreds of thousands of dollars they needed to buy the land uh, on this side of the island. You can get it cheaper other places, but here in West Hawaii and North Kona, you know, land's, land's very expensive. And so they got that and they managed to go through our county's rigorous and lengthy permitting process to finally get to the point to build the house, only to find out they didn't have the money or the resources to finish the house. Now, what you need to know is if you're a contractor, if you're a licensed contractor, you'll, you'll, you'll always see people say, well, you want to make sure that you get a, a contractor that's licensed and bonded. And that bonding is the part that I want to just mention for for a moment, because uh, for the most part, unless you're independently wealthy as a as a general contractor, when you begin the process of building a house, you have to go get what is known as a construction or a performance bond. It's essentially an insurance policy that says that once you start building it, you're going to be able to finish it. And uh, the, a couple of the local lumber houses here, HPM and Hansador Lumber, both uh, provide that free of charge, by the way, if you're a customer of theirs, because they're hoping, and I think the deal is, at least with one of those, that you have to buy half your lumber from them. And so it's not so much free as that they want you to buy their stuff, which, if you think about it, that's pretty brilliant. It's like, we'll bond you for free, but you got to buy your stuff from us. I think that's a pretty cool idea. But that's just this, this guarantee that that builder, that contractor, is going to be able to complete the job and get it to a point where you can get a certificate of occupancy and actually move in the place. Isn't it great to know that we don't have to have any sort of other person's guarantee when it comes to God? Because when God starts something, he's going to finish it. Guaranteed. I want to talk about that, how it relates to you and me who are followers of Jesus Christ here today. Let me say this as a parenthesis, and I'm going to follow this up in a few minutes, I promise you. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ here today, if you've never had a moment in your life when you realized that you were living a life as a sinner and that you were separated from God and that you would never come to have a relationship with Him, you'd never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord and asked Him to forgive you for the sins that He died for on the cross, If you've never done that, you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, don't turn the switch off, okay? Because as we go through the sermon this morning, I'm going to talk to you about how you can know how to do that. And so if you're listening now, before I get there, you'll kind of know some stuff if you decide to accept Jesus as your Savior today. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So don't turn it off. Stay with me. My sermon this morning is simply entitled, Completion Guaranteed. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, otherwise known as Philippians. And we're going to look at chapter 1, and we're really only going to look at one verse per se this morning, chapter 1, verse 6. And I'll get there in just a moment. I always like to share a little bit about why we're even looking at this letter and what it's all about. And so Paul's letter to the Philippians, again, this is a a, a town called Philippi. It was the first church that Paul evangelized in Europe. He had, he had been over in what is known as, in our world today, as, as Turkey, mostly in that area. And he had crossed over the Aegean Sea into Greece. And Philippi was the first city that he came to and that he evangelized. And so this church obviously was near and dear to his heart. This is known as a prison epistle. Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. But what's amazing about that is the basic theme of this letter is joy in Jesus. And so I want you to think about that. The man is in prison. And we're not talking about some sort of white collar, 
you know, you get to work out and watch TV and go to library kind of thing. We're talking about a Roman prison in the first century A.D. Not a pretty place. Not a pretty place. And yet he had joy in the Lord. And immediately speaking, as far as this letter is concerned, is that the church at Philippi was really the only church that was actively and consistently supporting him financially. Other than that, Paul was working as a tent maker, literally as a tent maker. And so he was writing to them to thank them for their financial support and the fact that they were partnering together in the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Within this letter, he does deal with the fact that there was some dissent within and there were some threats from without, but generally it's a joyful letter. And as we look at this one verse this morning, I want you to see it, and and I backed this up with my study this week, that this is a letter not just to the church as a whole, and by extension, we who are part of Jesus' church, but it's to us individually as followers of Jesus Christ as well. Now, as it would turn out, and, and I don't know if you know this about the Apostle Paul, but the man could write some long sentences. I mean, and, and they even call them Paul. And something that's in Paul style is called Pauline, not Pauline, but Pauline. And so that's actually come down to us in, in our modern era that when it's a long sentence, it's referred to as a Pauline sentence. And so, uh, most notably in that, over in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 are one sentence. Now, if you're reading the NIV or some other translation that's maybe geared a little bit differently, the editors of that translation in particular decide, let's put a few sentences in here so we don't lose these people along the way. Because sometimes when you're reading Paul, you got to almost throw out like breadcrumbs to make sure you followed where you went from. So, as would happen, and the reason I mentioned that is, as would happen, this verse happens to be in the middle of a sentence. So, let me give you a running start And actually read 3 through 7, and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at 6 specifically. Paul writes this in Philippians 1, verse 3 and following. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Completion guaranteed. Folks, the first thing I want you to think about this morning is this. And please under, please catch all these words. There is no good reason to ever doubt God. Do we do it? Guilty as charged. Is it with a good reason? Negative. There's never a good reason to doubt God. That's the first part of this verse. Being confident of this very thing. Confident here, the word means, uh, and it's translated elsewhere in the New Testament as being persuaded or convinced. And and I apologize, I don't think I'm doing it anywhere else in the sermon today, but just to give you a skosh of grammar, this word is in what is known as the perfect tense, the past tense. In other words, when he says being confident, I'm confident, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced, it's in the past, it's settled. I don't have to debate this with myself anymore, is what he is saying. Well, how do you get there? How do you get to where Paul is, where you can say in your heart, I'm convinced, God, I'm on board. I don't have to concern myself with whether or not you're going to get it done anymore. How do you get there in the Christian walk? Well, I think the easy way is watch God operate. Watch God work. I'm reminded as I say those words of, of Moses as he stood there with the children of Israel on the shore of the Red Sea with the, the, the um, Egyptian army breathing down their backs in an ocean uh, uh, coming at them in the ocean be, or the uh, sea behind them. And Moses says, watch God. 
Watch God. And he did something that nobody was expecting. He parted the Red Sea. And they walked through on dry ground, ladies and gentlemen. Dry ground. I hope you know that account. It's an amazing account of what God was able to do for a million and a half people stuck in the desert. But you and I have our backs against the wall all the time in all sorts of ways. Financially, spiritually, emotionally, situationally. And we can watch God operate. How do we see Him operate? Number one, we see Him operate in His Word. I hope and trust that you are reading His Word. Because that's where you see Him operate in a very real sense in many, many, many situations. We also see Him operate through prayer. Especially when He answers your prayer. And sometimes when He doesn't answer your prayer. I bet you folks probably have a few prayers you're glad He didn't answer. I know I've got a few of those. Because if He had done what I asked Him to do, I'd be in a big old mess. But folks, you take that together with real life evidence of seeing Him do things in your life, you're going, I never expected that. I don't know how He did that. I didn't ask Him. Has anybody had, ever had God do something for you you didn't ask Him to do? Yes, you have. All of you have. You didn't ask to be born, did you? Okay, let's start there. Did you get up this morning and say, God, I, I pray for my next breath. Okay, God, thank you for that. Can I pray for my next breath? Lord, can you get my blood running through my veins? He does all that for you. Without you asking, science calls it involuntary muscle reactions. But that's all God. That's all God. But I'm just so amazed. And, and it seems like almost every week I get some sort of a phone call in my life and I go, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And I just got to remember to remind myself, oh, that was God. That was God. That's who that was. Maybe, you, maybe you're hearing me say this this morning, though, and you say, you know, I hear you, Pastor, and that's all good, and you're standing out in front of us, and this is a church service, and I guess i got to amen that, but i got to be honest with you. I've been let down a few times. I didn't get that job that I wanted. I lost that loved one that I prayed for for weeks and months and years in some cases. But folks, having faith in God is more than just asking Him for stuff. You know, it... it, it I just wonder if we put God on the same plane with our favorite sports team. Because I watch people that they root for certain teams like, there's this team in Dallas that a lot of football players like. And every year they are convinced they're going to win a Super Bowl. Am I right? Every single year they're going to win a Super Bowl. One year they're going to do it probably. I know I think about my own experience and I was going to bring something this morning and I forgot to do it, but um, I, many, 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 many years ago, I went to the University of Virginia and, and um, loved their basketball program, but it wasn't until three years ago that that basketball program won the national championship. But here's the funny thing is I have a couple of fan groups that I hang out in. Since they won that thing, people anticipate that every year we're going to win it. I mean, they're saying that basketball season starts in November, and now they're talking about, I think our chances are good this year. I think our chances are good this year. It's like, probably not. You're probably not going to win. Last year, we didn't even get to the NCAA tournament. Oh, we was robbed. No, we just didn't have the horses in the barn last year to win the national championship. But there's an anticipation of excellence. There's an anticipation of victory. And I wonder sometimes why we don't have that same anticipation with God. Because He has proven Himself a whole lot more than my sports team has. Amen? But having faith in God is way more than saying, God bless this, God give me that. It also means seeking His will in all things. I brought this up in the Bible study on Wednesday night. Psalm 37.4 is a verse that you need to hitch your wagon to. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. The reason that the Lord doesn't answer our prayers is we're not delighting in Him. When you're praying stuff that is not in His will, He is not real excited about giving you that. However, if we delight in the Lord. That means that 
our desires are in line with Him. Not my will, but yours be done. If we're looking at with excitement at God's program, if we're looking at excitement with what God is doing in the world, if we're looking with excitement at what God is doing in our own lives, then when we pray, we're praying in accord with God's will. And God is going to align with that in what He performs. Does that mean that every single thing is going to be just right? No, probably not, because you and I are not perfect. And as close as we may think we are to God's will, sometimes we start to shade over to our own. Anybody else ever have that issue? Lord, I'm feeling good about me. I love you, Lord, but I'm thinking I got this. Oh, man. Chapter and verse. Because how often do we pray about what we want instead of asking Him for His guidance? I know I've shared this with you guys before. Some of you have never seen me before. I, I, I make this mistake sometimes, both as a pastor and in my day job and, and just in life in general. I'll pray this. Lord, help me figure this out. As opposed to, Lord, show me. Lord, show me. Do you see the difference in those two things? Lord, help me figure it out. So, Lord, I, I just need you for an assist. That's God as my co-pilot. Right? That's God as my co-pilot garbage. As opposed to, the Lord is on the throne of my life. Lord, you show me. It's a vast difference in those two things. So, I pray that prayer. Lord, help me figure this out. Two beats. Lord, forgive me for how I just prayed. And then we move on from there. But here's the point. God is truthful and God is able. You're not going to be the first person to catch God in a lie. You're not going to be the first person that says, Oh, God, see, I knew you couldn't do that. Because God is all powerful, all knowing, all able, at all times, in all situations. So what is Paul convinced of? What is he convinced of? He says, I am, I'm, I'm confident of this very thing. I'm persuaded. I'm convinced. It's settled for me. What is he convinced of? Two things. First off, he's convinced that God is the initiator. What does he say? Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you. God's the initiator of that, not you and me. God started that. And I want you to think about it this way. Um, and, and it's going to sound like I'm getting into economics or something like that. But you can look at good work from either a macro level, big picture. How many of you are big picture people? Just don't give me the details. I just want the big picture. How many of you are detail people? You, you love the details. Okay, I'm married to one of them. I am married to one of them. I remember years and years ago, before we were dating, we were working together and, and they were doing those Myers-Briggs tests. Anybody ever done Myers-Briggs? Oh, my goodness. And, and so I found out that I was an ENTP, which means I'm a big picture guy. And Christina is an ESTJ. That means she's a detail-oriented. And, and somebody said, can you describe what that means? And I, and, and I thought about it for a minute, and I managed to hack off most of the ESTJs in the room. Um, because I said, it's kind of like being in World War I. And I said, all the ESTJs are down in the trenches fighting the war with their guns. I'm in a biplane flying over, watching them down below. They didn't like that for some reason. Oh, Bruce just didn't like to get his hands dirty. I know what's going on here. I got it. So don't be offended. I'm right, but don't be offended. <laughs> Just kidding. Not really. Um, so I want you to think macro, micro for a minute. Macro, macro good works versus micro. The macro, the big picture, real simple, guys. It's your salvation. Because that drives everything, doesn't it? Let me give you a couple of quick verses. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You should know this one. He says, For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ladies and gentlemen, that means that you can't do anything. Your good works don't come from you. They come from God. Over in 2 Timothy 1.9, we read this. It's kind of in the middle of a sentence again. Thank you, Paul. He says, talking about God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And then finally, over in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 and 
4 through 7, it says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the renewing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Christ Jesus our Lord. You got it? Our good works aren't from us. They come from God. They have to start with Him. He is the initiator of that. And then at the micro level, okay, if the macro is our salvation, then the micro level as a follower of Jesus Christ is your daily service to Him as part of your salvation. Over in, where did I put that? Over in 2 Corinthians verse 9-8, we read this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Do you all the e- alls and everys in that? Did you hear all of that? That's God's daily sufficiency for you and I who are followers of Jesus Christ. So you see that micro is a direct result of the macro because there is no good in ourselves. And I told you at the beginning that I was going to talk about this for a minute, so I want to come back to this idea. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, the reality is that every one of us who breathes air on planet Earth was born with Adam's sin nature. And if nothing happened in our lives to change our sin nature, we would live this life, breathe our last, and die and spend an eternity in a place called hell because God will not accept sin into his heaven. You guys catching that? He will not accept sin into his heaven. Now, the corollary to that is, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you die and you go to heaven, which is what you're going to do, is what's been promised, is you will absolutely not only be rid from the power of sin, you will be literally rid of the presence of sin in heaven. That's your future. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but there it is. So if you're here this morning and you've never come to the realization that your sin is separating you from a holy and righteous God, then you will die and go to hell. That is a truth of the scriptures. That may not sit well with you, but it's the truth. And I want you to know, I'd rather you be offended by me and come to know Jesus Christ. Then like me a whole lot and die and go to that hell. That's not a place you want to be. Scripture says it this way, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, Jesus came to this earth He took the form of a man. He became a man. He was fully God and fully man. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. And at the end of that life, he was crucified on a cross. Not because he ever did anything wrong, but that was God's plan from the beginning. He was the perfect sacrifice to come and shed his blood for the sin of mankind. Scripture says that, and and by the way, he died on the cross for your sin and mine, became our substitute, took my penalty and your penalty upon that cross. But because he perfectly fulfilled that mission, three days later, God rose him from the dead. And he's never died ever again. He's alive today at the right hand of God the Father. Scripture tells us that if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he has raised... If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To confess means you agree with what I just said, that Jesus came to die for your sin. To believe in your heart means that you have a change. We call that repentance. You say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I turn now and follow you. If you do that, you're saved. That means that you're saved from hell and you're saved to a relationship with God the Father. And it's not just a heaven thing, guys. It's here. That's why we're talking about this today. If we just were saved and went to heaven, I don't need to preach this sermon. But the reality is what we're going to see here next. But let me say this one thing just before we go any further about this good work. I want you to catch this. God is not about wild goose chases. If you get off in the weeds, that's not God. That's you. I've got a drawer full of those t-shirts. Anybody else got a few of those floating around? That's not God. 
Now, I will say this. Sometimes God takes you down a path to teach you something. And so if you're in a place right now, you're going, I don't get it. May I encourage you to pray this prayer? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to teach me? I think you would be blown away if you pray that prayer in earnestness and humility. So why are we here? Because what Paul is secondly convinced of, not only is God the initiator, but God is the perfecter. Because he says this, listen to the verse, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, here it is, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That word complete is interchangeable with two other words in the New Testament. Perfect, and here's one for you, mature. Mature. He doesn't just finish the job, he does it perfectly. And I was talking about building earlier, so I'll give you another little building, building idea. You know, one of the things that you find out when you get somebody to build your house to do a project, usually at the end of it, you got a big old long punch list. Anybody ever had one of those in your house? And if you're like, um, if you're like the guy that built my house about nine years ago, he'd go through, uh, actually he told us, that here's a roll of blue painter's tape. Put tape everywhere you want us to fix. The house is almost blue when I got done. So <laughs> it is blue actually on the outside, but it's like, man, there's so much. But here's a question. If God, is, if God is faithful to complete us, both as a church and both as Christians, then why do some churches close their doors? Do you guys know that hundreds of churches close their doors every year? And why does it seem that some Christians never get there? And we see a lot of people walking away from the faith even. And you maybe have had some Christians in your life, maybe even you led them to Christ, and they just don't seem like they progress. Well, simply stated, God gives us free will and we're welcome to mess up our lives. That's it. You may not hit your potential as a follower of Jesus Christ. It takes surrender in order to do that. And I unfortunately run into too many people that are less Christians and they're more what I refer to as churchers. Churchers. They kind of hang in church. They may read their Bible a little bit. They may even pray. But that's kind of it. And guys, I just want to give you a picture of, of what that looks like in the secular world. If that's, if that's your, your experience of Jesus Christ, I want to put it to you in a, in a secular way. If this were a business, if, if Christian Walk was a business, this is the staff meeting. This is the weekly staff meeting. This is where we get the directives for what we're going to do for the next week. This is when we come in and bring the things that have gone on the week before. This is our staff meeting. What is the Bible? That's your training manual. That's the SOP. That's, that's how you do the job. And prayer, that's that stack of emails you get on Monday morning. At that point, you've not even started doing your job. And that's unfortunately where a lot of Christians kind of stop. Well, I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible. You've just gone to the staff meeting, you've got the SOP manual, and you've got a bunch of emails. What are you going to do with it? Because otherwise, you're kind of just stuck being a churcher. But catch this. God has a plan and a role for every one of His kids. If you're here this morning and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, He has a unique plan for every one of you. A plan that I can't do for you and you can't do for me. It's something that is specific for you and what God has called you to do. Now, some are flashier than others. i gotta be, I got to admit that. But nobody's left out. I want you to think about it this way. Anybody serve in the army? Right? Okay. Army needs infantry, doesn't it? And our army needs tanks. Army needs cooks and clerks, too. Everybody can't carry a gun. You guys follow me there? The Bible talks about it with gifts that are more honorable and less honorable. It's the verbiage that's used over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can read about that in your spare time. So all of that said... To wrap this up, he says, we'll complete it when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. That's a promise to everyone that's here that calls Jesus Christ their Lord. Because folks, the day of Jesus Christ is coming. When Jesus is coming back to gather his church together, to bring them into glory with glorified bodies, to spend an eternity with him in glory. Can I get an amen on that? 
I haven't put y'all all to sleep yet, have I? Okay. I mean, folks, that's what we're looking forward to. We're saved when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior Lord, but we have a future salvation that we're looking forward to. I know when you're caught up in the day-to-day and you're figuring out how to put a five where a 50 needs to go, you're trying to figure out how not to have to drive downtown one more time this week. You're trying to figure out how it can make the kids behave just for an hour, please, God. Maybe that just seems a little too far out there. But that is the promise that we have. And I want to say this to you today. Just one last thing for those of you that may be here this morning that don't know Jesus Christ. He talks about it the day of Jesus Christ. But to those who don't know Him, it's referred to in the Word of God as the day of the Lord. And that is the day of judgment when Jesus is going to judge those who never have accepted Him as Savior and Lord. Because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Some knees are going to bow and worship. And unfortunately, far more knees are going to bow in subjection to a holy and righteous God. But if you truly believe in Him, you're going to be a part of that day of Jesus Christ. So folks, life's going to let you down. People will let you down. The financial markets will let you down. Don't amen that one. But if you put your trust and your faith in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, He will never let you down. And your completion is guaranteed. Let's bow.